evening students today we are coming to talk about two diseases that may be common in our daily practice so far as eye care is concerned and these are found on the eyelids what are they these are calaisium and hodula in some jurisdictions this might be mentioned chalazion but for our purpose let's call it calaisium and hodula the plural of hodulum is hodula so hodula is the plural of what hodulum so when you hear hodula it means a lot of uh cases of hodulum <clears throat> okay so let me just remind you of one little anatomy we've seen this picture before but let me just remind you here you are within the tarsal plate in the eyelid you have the gland called the meibomian gland and it has its own orifice all right it is found posterior to the gray line so this is the meibomian gland with its own orifices okay it discharges its lipids to form the preconia tail from to be more specific the lipid layer to retard the evaporation of tears likewise in this picture you have the eyelash okay so the eyelash at the root of it you have two major glands you have what the gland of xyles and of course the gland of mold okay yes the eyelash is anterior to the gray line but look at the gland of mold and gland of xyles at the root of the eyelash so this is very important all right so now let's delve into the main uh, topic of our discussion what is calaisium well remember when the meibomian gland orifices are blocked now the meibomian gland cannot discharge its lipids to come and form part of the telephone <clears throat> so with time there is lipid accumulation okay within the gland itself it then forms what you call estera inflammatory granuloma within the tarsal plate and this is what we call calaisium very simple all right this is what we call calaisium it is found within the eyelid it can be in the lower eyelid or within the upper eyelid okay so if a group of people is it common it can be found in all age groups but mostly people within 30 and 50 years of age that is the group of people in which you commonly found calaisium but of course you can find it in younger people and in people who are older than age 50 years okay so when there's a problem with eyelid hygiene okay that is one major cause of it so because of debt accumulation the meibomian gland orifices are blocked so the lipid cannot be discharged or if there's any eyelid margin disease okay it can be scarring of the eyelid margin or just think about any disease of the eyelid that blocks the meibomian gland orifice okay this will lead to blockage of the discharge of lipid and lead to what granuloma formation and cause what you call calaisium right <clears throat> so this calaisium in this other scenario it is found within the upper eyelid okay look at it from this angle all right so that is it calaisium so what are the some of the consequences that calaisium may bring about if not attended to okay so first of all let's talk about its possible signs and symptoms okay <clears throat> what symptom with a patient with calaisium come with of course we we'll tell that there's a growth within the eyelid all right that causes some discomfort all right so this is the major type of uh, something that you may complain about sometimes if it's within the upper eyelid it may cause grouping of the upper eyelid and for that matter the patient may not be able to see well through the visual axis causing what decline in visual acuity as a result of what blepharoptosis because the eyelid is all grouped 
because of force of gravity, all right, the eyelid is drooped and the individual cannot see well. So it can cause decline in your visual acuity. Another problem it can cause is that it can press on the cornea, all right, and cause what we call astigmatism. So the person may have blurred vision, one, because the eyelid has drooped, which we call blephroptosis, or person may have blurred vision because the lesion or the growth is pressing on the cornea, <clears throat> causing what we call astigmatism. All right. Another way the person may have blurred vision is that the collision may press on the cornea, shorting the axial length um, relatively and cause hyperopia. That is another cause of what decline in the patient's visual acuity. Of course, it can cause um, <clears throat> disfigurement of the eyelid margins and cause cosmetic problems. So these are the major effects that one may get when one gets calasium, all right? So how do we manage calasium? First of all, let's remember that we are talking about lipid accumulation. Ladies and gentlemen, what happens when you apply heat to fat or lipids? Won't it melt? Yes, of course, it's going to melt. So first and foremost, we do what we call warm compresses, okay? For several days, if it doesn't resolve, then, okay, sometimes some of the clients you can really observe, and after a while, if whatever is blocking the release of the lipid at the lead margin is released, okay, the calcium may resolve on its own. If it doesn't, you can apply what we call the warm compresses method. If warm compresses doesn't help, then you can go surgical excision so we call it incision and curettage incision and curettage you just turn the eyelid inside out do little incision and then do curettage of the lipid within the tassa plate after which the patient is going to be okay without this type of deformation Sometimes, too, because it's inflammatory in nature, we may inject steroids. Okay, we may inject steroids <clears throat> for tonight. <clears throat> so, once you inject the steroid, it can work against this enzymatic inflammation and this lesion will resolve. But we don't inject steroids in all patients. There is a specific indication for steroid use. In the management of calasium, how patients whose calasia are close to the the pantum. Look at the pantum here. Okay, there's upper and then the lower. So, if you did incision and curettage close to pantum, you may anatomically destroy it, and that will affect your drainage. So, in those cases, it's better to what inject steroid into the calcium and after a few days if it doesn't resolve you can even repeat the injection of the steroid so if it doesn't resolve then go in for incision and curettage by being very cautious <clears throat> let's talk about hordeolum hordeolum so there are two types of hordeolum but remember that hodulum can be internal or what external so you can have external hodulum also known as thai or internal hodulum what are they once you hear hodulum it is talking about what abscess or acute infection acute infection or what abscess so <clears throat> let's talk about external hodulum. What is external hodulum? External hodulum refers to abscess or acute infection of the root of the eyelash. 
where we have two major glands, the gland of mold and gland of sires. So, any of them can be involved, or even the two of them can be involved. And it is quite painful. It's very painful. So, style also means external hordula. Why do I say it's external? It's external because one, we, it affects the root of the eyelash. Okay? And two, if nothing is done about this microabscess, which is formed over here, it may burst and discharge its content externally. That is why it's called external hodulum. Another reason why it's called external hodulum is that it is seen, okay, without you averting the eyelid. You can see it from outside and it affects what? The root of the eyelash forming what? An abscess or acute infection. All right. So here you are. Okay. More often than not, you see an eyelash protruding out of this particular microabscess. Okay, so the glands are affected, the gland of Zeiss and the gland of Mole. Any of them or one of them or even both of them together. That is what style. <clears throat> Look at other example of style over here or external hodulum. Have you seen it here? This at the upper eyelid. All right. And one thing about external hodulum is that if it is not treated, uh, diagnosed early, a uh, management started, it can lead to what we call preceptor cellulitis, and invariably proceed to orbital cellulitis if complications set in. So this external hodulum or Style. But here we have internal hodulum. What we have is an abscess, but internal hodulum affects the meibomian gland itself. Okay, it affects the meibomian gland itself. We observed from outside. If you were to observe this particular internal hodulum from outside, you realize that there will be an increase in that part. Okay, there will be inflammation externally from that part of the eyelid. But we are looking at it from an inverted eyelid margin from the conjunctiva area. But you can see an abscess of the meibomia gland <coughs> from this particular angle. So, whether internal or external hodula, there is a way we go about its management. Okay, but first of all, the etiological agent is what Staphylococcus aureus or Staphylococcus epidermidis. So it is a Staphylococcus infection. So it brings about its exotoxins that start causing micro destruction of these tissues, forming abscess. So it is what Staphylococcus in nature. How do we go about their management? Warm compresses first. Okay. We apply warm compresses. Once applying warm compresses, you can give to, to cycling ointment. And then, in addition to that, you give oral to, to cycling. <clears throat> to, to cycling is able to break down these exotoxins that are released by the staphylococcus and bring about cure or what I call healing or management. So, that is hodula. This is internal hodulum. Okay. That is external hodulum. This is external hodulum. And, of course, we have spoken about calasium. Ladies and gentlemen, remember, if you don't manage, because, uh, Hodulum very well, it will proceed to formation of preceptor cellulitis. And from preceptor cellulitis, it will go to orbital cellulitis mm -hmm. and cause a lot of havoc. At this juncture, I will end my lecture and urge you to continue watching these particular videos, okay? YouTubes, and put down certain difficulties that you may have. And once we meet in class, we're going to clarify them. 
until I see you again, stay safe. <coughs>
nowadays when I'm walking, people are pointing at my eyelid and saying that there's a growth over there. So those are the few problems that a patient may come out with. Ladies and gentlemen, how do you manage this? Well, because this is lipid, but first of all, sometimes you can just ask the patient, you, you need to find, examine the patient and find out the etiology. If it is inflammation of the eyelid, you treat. If it is death at the eyelid, you treat. If it is a problem that is treatable, why not? You treat and the calcium can resolve on its own spontaneously. But apart from everything, remember that because it is fat accumulation, if you apply heat, it can melt. So, we call something warm compresses. You can apply warm compresses to this and after a while, it will resolve on its own. If warm compresses don't help it to resolve, you can inject steroids. Okay? We call it trypsinolone steroid injection into the growth. Okay? You can inject steroid in form of trypsinolone into the growth and it can work against the inflammatory cytokines produced by <clears throat> this particular growth and sometimes by staphylococcus okay so within days to a week if the steroid doesn't help then you can in fact repeat the steroid injection into the growth sometimes to we use steroids if the growth is close to the pantum because if the surgeon is not experienced, he can distort the anatomical architecture of the pantum and destroy tear growth, tear flow and drainage. So all things being equal, if all these methods fail, you go surgical. What do we do? You turn the eyelid inside out and do what we call incision and curettage. So you incise through the growth through the conjunctival way and then take off all the lipids that have formed the granuloma away and it flattens and the patient becomes good. When you talk about hodiolum or hodiola it means abscess or acute infection within the eyelid margin or within the tarsal plate there are two types external hodiolum and the internal hodiolum when you hear external hodiolum it means that it's talking about the infection or micro abscesses or abscess that occurs at the root of the eyelash specifically affecting the gland of size and gland of mold why do we say it's external well it's external because one it can be seen while the patient is sitting in front of you so externally seen and the reason why it's called external hodulum that is type is that if nothing is done about this uh, micro abscess, naturally it will break loose and its content will discharge outwardly. That is why it is called external hodulum. This one is also external hodulum. But it is getting complicated. Why? Because it has not just affected the eyelid margin. That it's at the level of the eyelashes but it has extended to include almost the whole length of the tarsal plate almost developing itself into what preceptor cellulitis <clears throat> let's look at this other one it's called internal hodiolum why is it internal because it's hidden internally this Type does not affect the root of the eyelashes, but what it affects the meibomian gland itself. Look at micro abscess here within the tarsal plate. 
That's why it's called internal hodulum. Whether internal or external hodulum, their etiology is one, which is one, which is staphylococcus. Staphylococcus. Okay? So, it has its own exotoxins, and once it releases them, it causes this tissue destruction from macroabscesses. Alright? So, there are two major ones. The first and foremost is what? Staphylococcus aureus. But in contribution to this, sometimes you don't have Staphylococcus aureus, but you have what? Staphylococcus epidermidis. So you can have the combination of the two or one. But more often than not, the victim is what? Staphylococcus aureus. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, in this other case scenario, whether internal or external hodulum, we need to apply warm compresses. Okay? Alright. So, there is one type of antibiotic which works so well when it is hodulum or hodula. Okay? The tetracyclines. Alright? They are able to break down the exotoxins that are released by the staphylococcus so well so what do you do the patient does home compresses in the mornings and then in the evenings you give them tetracycline ointment to apply on the globe itself making sure it goes into the conjunctiva very well at the same time you give them what tetracycline tablets likewise there are certain clients that when they have calasium, okay, because calasium may be inflammatory, but some type of microorganisms have been associated with it, especially clients who have acne rosacea, and they have a lot of lesions, okay, on their faces. They may have recurrent calasium. If you take it off, so it comes. In those cases. <clears throat> It will not just be enough to give warm compresses. It will not just be enough in terms of calcium to give injection of steroids into the lesion. Okay? But again, it will not be enough to also do incision and curettage because you have several of them on the patient's face if they have acne rosacea. What do you do? You, after from all this management plan that you have, you need to give them oral tetracycline. That is, if they have the lesion all over their face. Okay? Students, I want to end my lecture here. And if you want to continue listening to this particular YouTube, go to my channels, watch them several times, and put down any questions that you may have. And once we meet in class, I'm going to clarify them. Until then, stay safe.